Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session. Thank you all for choosing to spend your lunch break with us today and join our webinar. My name is Mindy Hunthrop, and I work with the Operations Management Master's Degree Program at the University of Arkansas. So as most of you know, um, this webinar series is hosted by the MS in Engineering, MS in Engineering Management, and MS in Operations Management degree programs. So here's just a little bit of information about those programs that sponsor this lovely event. So to tell you a little bit about today's presenter, um, Dr. Art is a 21st Century Leadership Chair in Engineering, Professor of Industrial Engineering, and the Co-Director of the Institute of Advanced Data Analytics at the University of Arkansas. So before he came to the U of A, uh, Dr. Art worked as a full professor in the Departments of Industrial and Systems Engineering and Radiology as an adjunct professor in the Department of Bioengineering at the University of Washington in Seattle. And there he also served as the Associate Director of the Integrated Brain Imaging Center at the UW Medical Center. So before he moved to Seattle, he also worked as a visiting associate professor in the Department of Operations Research and Financial Engineering at Princeton University. And he was also on the faculty in the Department of Industrial and Systems Engineering at Rutgers University. So he's got a lot of great experience. And before he was in academia, he also worked in corporate strategic research with ExxonMobil Research and Engineering. And he also holds three patents of a seizure prediction system. Uh, Dr. Art has received numerous academic honors, such as the National Science Foundation Career Award, and most recently, the 2018 Technical Innovation and Industrial Engineering Award from the Institute of in for Industrial Engineers, for Industrial and Systems Engineers, I'm sorry. He has edited four books and published over 175 research articles, and he currently serves as the department editor, associate editor, and editorial board member of 10 leading international journals. So with that, I am proud to present to you Dr. Art as today's webinar presenter. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you, Mindy, for a very kind introduction. Um, it's an honor to, to be here and, and to have this opportunity to share with you um, some of the uh, work I do in data analytics. Um, and um, so for today's talk, um, I will... Uh, turn off uh, my camera and we'll go through the slides. So for today's talk, we'll, um, I'll divide it, the talk into um, three sections. The first section is to give you um, a broad overview of data analytics. Okay, so people talk about data analytics, data science, machine learning, and AI, all of this. So we'll discuss some of um, the basic definition and overview of what data analytics is. And then um, the second uh, section, I'll talk about some of the real-world use cases, uh, some of the problems, some of the data that you see, um, you know, around you every day, um, something that you can relate to. And in the last section, I'll talk a little bit more in technical detail, but it will be non-threatening, I promise you that, um, on the some of the real, you know, problem and, and definitions of um, a little bit of mathematical model um, of data analytics problem that that that's you know go behind all these real life problem, and I'll share a couple um, of my um, research work um, that have you know been used and been applied, um, and most of them will be in medical application. Um, so with that, I'll start it off with um, introduction of data analytics. Okay. As you know, um, the cost of storage is has gone down drastically um, in the past 10, 20 years. So we keep collecting more and more data. Um, and again, 90% of the work on data has been created in the last two years. Um, everything you know around you, ranging from you know all the click that you do on the website, um, they track everything. Every, single click that you do and how much time you spend on each page and so on and so forth. That's an example. Um, and again, in in the industry, um, we hold so many, um, so much data that's more than U.S. Library of Congress. Even. Um, so basically, we swamp with data. And um, I just want to share um, 
some of these graphic that when Bill Gates started Microsoft, you know, back in 70s and whatnot, he thought that 640 kilobytes of data should be enough for everyone. Again, back then we were talking about, um, you know, the green screen, monochrome uh, screen, and we don't have graphics back then, you know, everything is textual data. So if you store only textual data, yes, I think 640 kilobyte of data should be enough. But today is we keep everything um, from voice, voices, from pictures, videos, everything around us. So we have gone far enough from kilobytes of data to set of bytes of data. Um, and if you still remember in the old days, you know, if you're old enough, you get to see these eight inch floppy um, that was used, introduced in the 60s. And we moved to five and a quarter inch drive that, that was used until I think in the 90s. And then we moved to three and a half inch disk and then the zip drive and thumb drive and, and today. Um, so, um, like I said, everything we do um, today, it, all the data is being collected. Um, um, my, our, um, you know, movement, uh, purchasing history, where will we go, our GPS, um, personal health record, business transaction. So everything has been collected. Um, that, that, there's so much of information. And then if you keep talking about, yes, the data uh, all around us, but if you can divide it, like the sources of data that, that we collect, okay? According to Gartner, Gartner divided the source of data uh, from public data, social media data, commercial data, uh, data from partner, employee, consumer, uh, or enterprise data. But really, if, if, if I want to divide up um, we can say one is enterprise data, okay? Uh, it could be the data that we use, already use, and it would be the data that we have yet to tap into. The other source of data will be from the internet, social media data, like Twitter, Facebook data, um, our browsing history, and so on and so forth. Um, another source of data will be um, communications data, um, you know, we the text messages, voice over IP call that we do, um, video call, or even the webinar that we're doing, okay? And the last source of data that has becoming more and more uh, prevalent in our today's life is the Internet of Things. So those are census data, right? So you want to look at history of your sensor data, uh, what's going on, Think about um, Nest, um, thermostat, for example. It, it's, it's simply sensor data that learn how your behavior, how you like your temperature to be at this time, at this day, and so on and so forth. So these are all the data that, 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 that we swamp with. Um, so with all of these data, right, and people keep saying data is a new oil. Um, What's data analytics and what's data science, right? Basically, these are new technologies, advancements that, that we trying to create um, to help us make sense of the new data that we, we've seen that I talked about earlier, okay? So basically, how we can refine the oil or how we can, how we can refine the data that we have and become more intelligent in our decision. Okay, so if you look at the companies today, big, big companies today, you know, talking about Apple, Google, Amazon, Uber, Microsoft, Facebook, and so on and so forth. Um, so these are data company, or even Alibaba. Jack Ma said uh, Alibaba is not an e-commerce company, it's a data company. So, so really, there's a lot of... Um, utility value of these data if we can be smart um, with it. Right? For example, um, Gartner estimated that the data 
um, in the organization that we all have collected in your organization um, are still underutilized. Okay, sometimes we call it dark data, and that could bring up the value to you know maybe 38% more than what we've used so far. Um, more details of customers and suppliers, for example, Walmart using um, vendor uh, um, vendor managed inventory system where Walmart sell, uh, share um, the sales, the transaction of uh, the product that supplier provide to Walmart. Um, and so that, you know, the vendor or the supplier can better manage inventory, you know, that will help Walmart better manage its own inventory and so on and so forth. And social media content that people try to understand what's going on in social media. Maybe there's a hype and things might sell a little bit better um, based on social media um, that, that we see. And, And then I like to refer to data analytics as these data information knowledge and wisdom pyramid that people talk about, right? We start off with data. So we want to refine the data to get information. So we understand who's doing what, where, and how many, and when, and why. So we can connect um, the data. We can categorize the data. We can try to correct the data if the data is not correct. Um, once we get to the information level, then we can look at relationships in the data. Uh, we can kind of contextualize the data. Uh, maybe that provides some insights that would help us take better action and help us predict consequences uh, from the data. And it go to the knowledge level where we already have to contextualize information then you can understand, um, create a knowledge of the system or what's going on around us where we collect the data. Um, and then we can go up to wisdom where we can apply um, this knowledge. Once we have the knowledge, something we can practice, get better understanding, take better action. So in short, data analytics, or sometimes people call it data science, is one of the fastest growing fields in this decade. Um, data analytics is a science of explaining raw data in the purpose of drawing conclusions about that information, create knowledge, and taking action. So there's a many levels uh, of um, data analytics. You do, one can go from um, descriptive analytics, descriptive level. Um, basically, we look back at the data, try to understand what happened, why did it happen, um, and then once we understand what's going on in the past, then we try to go with predictive analytics, um, try to predict what will happen. Right? Once we predict what will happen, then we can make action. So how can we make it happen or what actions we should take if it's happened. For example, think about the weather prediction. We look at all the history of what's going on in you know, your local area, what the weather is like, and, look, and predict what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, if it's forecast that it's going to rain, then the action should be should you, that you should take the umbrella with you, and so on and so forth. Um, that's an example. And if you think about a business problem, if you try to Let's take Walmart, for example. If you try to uh, use a historical demand of a product, you can predict the, the demand of the future, and then you can think about how much of the inventory you should carry to optimize or to maximize the sales and you know, optimize your, your, your operations and so on and so forth. Um, so if you were to lay these different level of data analytics, right? So you can go from um, the data to insight to decision, and you go to the past, present, and future, right? If, um, you know, in the 2000s, we talk about data, we talk about descriptive analytics, that's where we use BI system, business intelligence system, we use dashboard, we use visualization. Once we understand that, we can make its own planning. Um, so, for example, I worked for ExxonMobil um, in early 2000s. Um, 
we still use Excel. Back then, we use Excel, try to look at the demand, and we try to match the demand and delivery by hand using Excel. So basically, we, we, we visualize the data and we do the planning by hand. But today, you know, we, we moved up um, in terms of business value. We could try to predict what's going to happen. We can use machine learning statistics, data mining, um, modeling, and try to predict what happened. And once we predict what happened, right, the the decision or the action that we have to take will be, okay, well, what do we want to optimize, right? We want to uh, up, you know, maximize the sales or up to maximize the revenue, or we can create the rules. If this has happened, this is what we're going to do. And then we can do some, some, some sort of simulation if, you know, our prediction or the future data follow the same pattern as the, the past data. This is what we'll, we will do. And again, this is just to show you that data analytics is a study, it's a new technology, is what we try to get away from business intelligence. So we understand the past, okay, then we want to move forward to the future, uh, and we can actually optimize our decision. So all in all, there's opportunities um, of, uh, you know, how one can improve um, their business decisions uh, using data analytics, right? So we can make better informed decision. We try to discover hidden patterns, insights, things that we haven't seen before. And then once we have this model, we can kind of automate business processes. We can create rules. If this is what happened, this is what we're going to do. And that will be automation, feedback loop that will go to AI and automation and so on and so forth. Um, now, that we talked about data analytics and data science, and you probably have heard um, big data. So what, what was big data and what does it have to do with uh, data analytics? So if you think about um, the data that you collect, okay, if the data that you, you have and your analysis, your prediction model and everything can fit into your laptop. And when you build the model and the model can fit in memory, right, so that you don't really need to deal with big data. Um, but now, but what if you collect data, your customer data, your enterprise data is, is too big to, to fit into a laptop? So you really need an infrastructure that would be able to hold your data. You need data warehouse. You probably need a data lake to hold your data so you can run all these analyses. Let's take an example. If your data, you try to build a prediction model um, and you have a history of, let's say, in the range of 10,000 transactions, you want to pre build a prediction model. That's probably can fit into your laptop. But if you're talking about millions or hundreds of millions of transactions um, that you have in your data that you collect, probably it will not fit in your laptop, right? You're either going to have your own private cloud or you can use public cloud to store and process your data. So that what's big data will come in. Of course, all the algorithms, machine learning algorithms and data analytics, or all of the analyses that we will do will have to be adjusted when we go to, um, to the cloud with the big data. You might want to dispute um, your computation so that you can be more efficient with your analyses. So that's something that we'll uh, have to do with the big data. For example, um, just I think a couple of days ago, Amazon uh, released um, free training, big data analytics training um, that Amazon has in-house, have, has had for years. And now they share with everyone who wants to study, uh, who wants to learn about big data and data analytics, of course. And it will be uh, implemented in, under AWS. So for example, if one wants to go to the cloud, collect the data, store the data on the cloud, and how one can implement the data analytics uh, process um, on the cloud, on AWS. One can kind of take that course and, and, and understand that. So, so in this uh, webinar, I will focus mainly on the data analytics itself. 
again, I can draw the big the, the picture of what big data is and how it's related to to um, data analytics. Okay, so for the big data, um, as you can see in the big data ecosystem, you talk about visualization and analytics, right? Uh, you can use SAP, you can use Click, you can use Power BI. That will be more of visualization or Tableau. Uh, R on Python will be more on the advanced analytics. Um, in terms of computation, if you have to dis do the distributed computing or parallelize your process, then you use Hadoop, Hive, and Spark, and so on and so forth. And then if you need somewhere to store your data, you can look at the uh, S3 of Amazon on AWS. Um, Kudu and MapR and um, use IBM. Um, and then if you want to go with data warehouse, um, you can do Teradata, um, Cardinal System, and you know, Hortonworks and Oracle, SAP. So you can collect all these data. So these are you know, part of these big data ecosystem and data analytics. Um, is if you if you will is at the top of the the ecosystem layer top layer of the ecosystem, right? So in a way, you need to have data warehouse and then connect to the storage, and do the computation, and then the interface between the users and the data will be at the layer of visualization and analytics. So that will be the focus around um, the, of of this webinar. So now we're going to shift gears and talk about real-life data analytics problems, some of the problems that you've seen. Um, so if we take one step back, that okay, if we have more data, we can make better decisions. So, you know, typical questions would be, what kind of decision we can make better? Uh, for example, you can think about how to reduce costs, um, you know, making better decision making on the information, select the right uh, option, or you can think about new products and new services that you can provide uh, with this data. So, and again, analytics is everywhere. Um, it's something that you see every day, um, including personalization, um, for example, recommendation offerings that you see in your email or the mailing that you see um, um, in your mailbox. Okay, for example, you, everyone probably gets a lot of uh, credit card offering. Um, they, they send that to you because you should have a good credit score and they, you should be a good customer. That's why they, they send that to you. Um, personal assistance, um, sort of uh, using analytics to, to, to look at your data, help you uh, with the fraud detection, travels, all these, um, these around us, and these are analytic problems. So um, I can kind of categorize um, one of the most, you know, sort of top widely used analytics uh, applications that we see. Uh, one of the classic problems that, 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 that been around uh, it's called risk analysis. Um, if you think about bank or uh, credit card companies, um, the idea is to reduce the risk of loans, um, of giving out loans um, to delinquent customers, right? So in the past, um, they use credit scoring models um, and use machine learning, a technique called discriminant analysis, to create a score function that separates out risky customers. For example, what credit score is the threshold? Is how what should be the score, the minimum score that you need to have so that uh, the bank or credit card will, will give out a new loan or you apply for a new credit card and they will approve it, right? So you can decrease the call at debt, for example. And again, that's the classic example where credit score, uh, where it looks at your um, payment pattern, what's your debt load, um, how often do you pay on time? That everything would reflect in your credit score, right? But again, if you talk, if you go to Asia, you go now with 
WeChat, um, you know, a lot of these um, online social platform, they actually do create a scoring based on behavior of, okay, what you look at, what web website you're browsing to, and it's not just the credit score now, it becomes your behavior. So that will give, um, you know, more fine-grained detail of, of, of the likelihood of uh, being delinquent. Um, again, risk analysis, if you think about the old in the 80s, um, credit card had uniform pricing. Uh, in the old day, everyone paying the same uh, APR. So everyone was getting the same offer. Uh, until in the 80s, uh, Signet, which is a small regional bank in Virginia, uh, started thinking about modeling, giving personalized offer, basically everyone getting different um, APR percentage and and try to make better offer to the best customers basically if you you know good customer you probably get 0% APR for the first six months and then you know they, they will bump up your APR but the point is try to make you become the customers and that bank have changed the name uh, over the years to become uh, Capital One Bank uh, today um, as you see that Capital One Bank seem to be doing really well with the credit card. Um, fraud detection, for example, if you have a Capital One card or um, you know other brand. Uh, when you make transaction um, outside of your state or you make your transaction overseas, you'll get a lot of um, emails or texts and asking, is this transaction legit? Is this um, something that you intentionally use or is this a fraud so that will become um, more proactive in, in terms of prediction um, for example if you have um, capital one card if you have the charge the same charge twice by the same um, vendor um, you know within I don't know five minutes and they will ask you is this a duplicate charge for example and you know they use logistic regression neural networks these machine learning to identify characteristic of fraudulent cases to prevent the future um, you know activities so you can you know kind of stop these uh, fraudulent activities beforehand um, and one can use uh, you know with insurance analytics and um, try to predict uh, you know, using the claim with uh, insurance claim, is this a fraudulent claim or not? So you can try to look at the um, prediction of try to reduce the fraudulent claim uh, and then you don't really have to investigate all the claims. You can reduce the time, the amount, uh, number of um, uh, workforce that you need to, to, do, to do that. Um, another application is recommendation system. It's something that you see on Amazon Prime, Netflix. All the recommendation, um, you go to walmart.com or amazon.com, um, or even on your Facebook, it has a lot of recommendations that you're interested in this product and you're not. So they use a technique called collaborative filtering. Uh, the idea is to use your historical data, your behavior, and behavior of people who tend to have the same behavior like you, but that customer like the product that you have yet to buy, then they would make recommendation for you. So the idea is to increase the revenues by doing cross-selling, upselling, so the product how to bundle things up together. Um, so just like market basket analysis where they look at what you buy, what else you're gonna buy with this product, for example. Um, if you in, in early 2000, um, Netflix, um, I'm not sure if you recall, Netflix was still mailing out DVDs uh, by postal mail in the old day. Um, and then uh, I think it's around 2004, 2005, Netflix um, um, had the uh, offer the uh, competitions uh, with $1 million grand price to do the Cinematch basically try to predict the, the um, personal movie recommendations based on customer unit tests. So they seem to be uh, doing pretty well um, from there, and that's become history now. Netflix has grown so fast that they can actually help you uh, with a lot of things. 
Um, and then recommendation system, if you go to, to Amazon, you know, you open your front page of Amazon, your, your front page of Amazon will be different. Um, for you versus mine, mine will show historical data, historical items that I browse, all the things that might be related to what I bought before. So again, the data will be your shopping cart, your rich list, previous purchases, item rated and reviewed, the location, the time, the duration of the view, all these so that they can actually make um, recommendation for you to buy. So that would go to, um, you know, marketing, um, hopefully to have better response rate, uh, saving the campaign cost, the ads on Facebook that if you go to Amazon.com and then you browse a few items and then you go to Facebook, you probably see that item popping up in your feed. That's an example of how one can use it data um, to make, um, make um, analytics um, to help with marketing. So another example uh, with um, predicting demand, uh, here's a case of DBS Bank, that's Development Bank of Singapore, that Singapore, that's in Asia, that's a, the, one of the biggest banks in Asia. Uh, what they try to use analytics to do is to forecast ATM, uh, cash demands. So if you think about ATM, each ATM that you go to could hold maybe up to $100,000. So the money in there is range about 10000 to 100000 200000 Let's say on average it's about 50,000. And each bank has about, say, uh, 10,000 ATMs location, right? Let's say we have 50 states. Each state has 200 ATMs, just to be conservative, right? That, you know, we haven't included the federal district in DC and five major territories and so on and so forth. Let's assume that each bank has about 10,000 ATM location and each location holds about $50,000. So um, you're talking about $500 million sitting in cash right there that the bank could use it for something else. So if you can predict the demand better, uh, let's say if you improve it by, say, 30%, so you can take, you can use that $160 million on something else to do it. So that's, for example, of uh, analytics going from historical demand to predict the future demand and take action. Um, again, another predicting demand, prediction of demand is to uh, predict um, the re-emission. Um, back when uh, at the Accountable Care Act, uh, President Obama launched, I think, a few years ago, um, a lot of hospitals, um, you know, put more attention in terms of re-emission of the hospital, uh, hospital re-emission. So because if, if you treat someone basically uh, and you, uh, you admit someone and you treat the person and you discharge the person and the person come back within 30 days with the same uh, condition, then you can't really charge more for the insurance. You have to, to treat the, pay, the person. Um, there's an open competition that you have to predict which patient are most likely to be readmitted to the hospital. Um, in the next year or in the next 30 days and so on and so forth. So that would help. Um, I worked on the data of uh, hospital readmission at University of Washington Medical Center, and that's real. Sometimes it's hard. Um, and again, um, one of the variables that, that we saw uh, that seemed to be important in terms of readmission was the, uh, the marital status. And people who are married twice likely to, to, to be readmitted uh, to, in the next 30 days uh, versus someone who's single. And again, there's a lot of things that we can draw from that conclusion that we can explain. You know, you can have someone who can care for you, you can take you to the hospital. And so that probably could be one of the um, variables. So I think I've given enough of the overview of um, concept of what data analytics is and real-world problem. Then I'm going to dive down into the, the overall concept of the, the working parts of, of data analytics and machine learning, right? So if you think about data analytics, okay, the first step is descriptive analytics, right? So the first level 
is to provide summary statistics of current and historical data to provide insights into what happened and why. Okay, that's the first step. So really what we're trying to do is to, 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 to investigate associations of data. It could be from visualization or the plot that we see, the trend reporting, uh, affinity analysis or market basket analysis, like you buy this product with what? We look at correlation analysis, or economists like to use style effect. So basically you have to organize the data into different sample, okay? And you have your columns will be features. Sometimes we call it variable. Sometimes we call it um, um, variable, um, predictor variables, features, um, data role. Um, there's a lot of name that we call. So, but that uh, will, will be the data where that where um, these features describe sample one could be could be transaction. It could be um, customer number one. And the feature could be gender, location, and so on and so forth, right? So in the case of, let's say, let's take hospital remission, it would be the gender, the age, the condition that the, the patient came in for, um, heart, uh, the, the, the heart rate, uh, the blood pressure, and so on and so forth, right? So that will be characteristic of patient number one, right? Um, so that would be um, a typical format of the data that people in data analytics would uh, would work around. Okay. So again, the idea is to say, okay, well, whether or not this person will be readmitted, maybe it's, it's correlated with the marital status, for example. So that will be the descriptive analytics. But if we move to predictive analytics, we will have an extra column. Sometimes we call it respond variables, um, respond values, or target patterns. So that will be um, the target that we want to build the model, right? So once we see the correlation, we can use machine learning algorithms um, to build a predictive model that will go from training and validation um, data to make predictions of unseen data. And those machine learning algorithms include support vector machines, logistic regression, decision tree, random forest, basin, neural networks, deep learning, nearest neighbors. So really the data that we look at will be um, features, or sometimes called predictive variables, and the response values in the training data. So if the response values is continuous values, this problem become regression problem. But if the response value is categorical, meaning that it's either 0, 1, or 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. The, the problem will become classification problem. So if, um, so that's the sort of basic of um, descriptive analytics and predictive analytics. And if you look at the, the pipeline of, of, of how one can perform data analytics, okay, so going from the real world, um, um, you can see that real world data, you have sensors or devices to collect data. It could be signals, could be images, could be database, could be anything. And it will be pre-processing, how you can extract the data so that you can create these data table or in data analytics, what we call a data frame, where we have the data. Um, uh, and then if your data, you have too many variables, one can reduce the dimensionality of the data using feature selection or feature fusion or feature projection. And one can make prediction, either classification, regression, or clustering, and then select the model using cost validation and get the result. Um, and again, these are pretty much a typical uh, topic in analytics and machine learning, feature extraction or feature engineering, feature selection, classification, regression, and clustering. So in this webinar, I'll talk more on classification, regression, and feature selection. So, but we start out with descriptive analytics. Um, descriptive analytics, basically, it's help you understand the data. Once you have the data frame or data table, you can try to look at um, 
statistical uh, characteristics of a um, single set of columns that will be unit value analyses can be summary statistics ranging from histogram, a number of data points, mean of max, central tendency, the mean, median, mode, uh, quantile, or dispersion, the range of variance, or the skewedness of the data. But if you have the data and you go with multivariate analysis, you can investigate how two or more variables are connected or related. A lot of times, use visualization to observe the relationship between two variables. Uh, for example, we try to see the trend of the sales. So two variables would be time and the sales. So you can see if it goes up, basically the sales increasing, so you're doing well. If the trend's down, then yeah, you, know, you lose market share and so on and so forth. And correlation of covariance often used to quantify the relationship between two variables. So that will be your basic descriptive analytics. Um, and another use of um, descriptive analytics is to uh, use market basket analysis, for example. Uh, if you go to Walmart, you can see that if you browse and try to buy a vacuum cleaner, uh, Walmart website will show you uh, other vacuum cleaner that a customer might a customer might consider, right? But if you go to Amazon, Amazon will try to do the cross sell. Uh, basically, you look at the uh, toilet bowl and look at all the things that people usually buy with toilet bowl. So it um, it's for different purposes, uh, different purposes. Like for Walmart, basically help customer pick the you know the best possible product. But Amazon tend to focus more on the cross sell, basically sell the toilet bowl and what else you know do people buy with toilet bowl by using simply uh, market basket data. Um, and again, you can do cross sell, you can do uh, affinity positioning. So just to give you an example, let's say if you have a transaction, your data, you have customer one buying beer, pretzel, potato chip, aspirin, and so on and so forth. So let's say you collect six um, um, transactions for six customers, and then you try to create the data. You can look at co-occurring table to see, okay, how many people buy these products together. Um, beer versus beer, of course, diagonal would not mean anything, but anything that off diagonal will kind of give you uh, the, you know, the likelihood of uh, buying beer with potato chips. Um, and in market basket analysis or association rule mining, so the idea is to come up with if and then uh, part. So basically, if you have item set, basically a set of products. If you buy this set of product, then what else are you going to buy, right? Um, and they use algorithm that's called a priori algorithm to find frequent item sets. For example, if you look at, if you go back to this transaction, you will not care too much about the items that people rarely buy because you don't care about the cross sale of that product and that will not you know, be applicable to many customers. You want to create an upsell or cross sell of the items that, that would you know, cover, have good enough coverage of the people. Therefore, the idea is to use our prior algorithm to find the frequent item sets. And then the idea is to mine the rules so that you get if People buy X will buy Y based on confidence. So that's based on probability. If A, then B, then the um, supermarket, for example, can do the cross sale. For example, if you buy these products, you bundle these together, you get a discount $1, for example. Um, you probably see that if you go to supermarket. That's an example of how you use um, market basket analysis, and that based on descriptive analytics. At University of Arkansas, we have data from Sam's Club. That's an older data, but it's kind of give you um, transaction level data. But of course, it, you will have different market, different thing, and you have relational database that you really need to do the data processing to connect and, and create a market basket analysis, for example. Um, now, I'm going to shift gear towards uh, predictive analytics, and we'll talk more about machine learning algorithms. Okay, so um, according to Kaggle, uh, machine learning algorithms, the most popular machine learning algorithm now that people use will be logistic regression. 
Uh, this is in three random forest neural networks, Bayesian model, uh, some of deep learning. Okay, so like I said, in machine learning algorithm, you have a set of X, which is the features, and a set of target, which is your Y, what what you want to predict. If your Y is continuous value, it will be regression. If the Y is categorical value, it will be classification. So I'm going to give you a brief um, overview, kind of in a non-training way of logistic regression. So the idea of logistic regression is to build a linear regression model. But, but your Y that you try to regress is the odd ratio. Okay. So the idea of is like probability. For example, if you try to predict when or not tomorrow is going to rain, so the R is usually written as 5 to 1 R. So basically it's like 1 out of 5, or it's 20% probability. So here we consider posterior probability. So imagine if you go back to my Y and X that I defined in the previous slides over here. So X is a set of vectors over here that your input variables, things that you try to, to the data you try to build, so that you can build a model to predict your y. Okay, so essentially, you try to come up with a posterior probability. Basically, if you have a new x, what's the probability of your y? So that if it's classification, so y is either rain or not no rain, um, or probably a winning. Or, or we're probably losing. So the idea of logistic regression is nothing more than a standard linear regression so over here. So you have beta 0 plus beta 1x, right? But what you're regressing is the odd, the, the odd ratio, is the log probability of the odd ratio. So the odd ratio is probably a y given x. So let's say if this probability of you know, tomorrow going to rain, 1 minus probability of no rain, right? So one minus of probably going to rain going to be no rain. So that's a odd ratio, and you take the log, the natural log, and you kind of regress it out as a linear equation. So if you move the term around, the logistic regression is nothing more than uh, this probability, the positive probability of logistic uh, function over here that you can solve according to x, and then you can estimate your beta zero and beta one. That's an example of logistic regression of a prediction model. So once you have these estimation, you estimate your parameter beta 0 and beta 1, and beta 1 is a vector. And x will be your training data, right? So once you estimate these based on your training data, when you have a new data set, you plug in your x, and then you will get this, the probability of, let's say, go tomorrow going to rain or no rain. And then if the probability of if tomorrow is going to rain is higher, then you're going to predict is tomorrow going to rain. Um, another example is Bayesian model or naive Bayes classifier. The idea revolves around um, using probability y given x, and again in this case I use uh, omega uh, omega y right here um, to represent y. So the idea is try to estimate the uh, likelihood probability from the training data and the prior probability of that event, let's say the rain or no rain, and the evidence probability. So the key idea of naive Bay classifier is to assume that these joint probability density function is independent. Basically, you can try to find uh, conditional probability fu density function for each variable independently. And then once you have that, you can kind of, once you have a new value of x, then you try to estimate uh, the likelihood function, and then you, and you multiply them all together, and you make the decision. So the key idea really is to estimate the distribution. One can assume if it's normal distribution or kernel distribution, multinomial distribution, or multivariate multinomial distribution, if you don't assume the two variables are independent. Um, support victim machine, for example, the idea is to find the hyperplane that you can separate the data uh, with the largest margin. Um, basically, the idea is to do the mapping, find the weight vector w, so that you can find the margin that separates the two data. If the data cannot 
be separated, um, we will try to minimize a misclassified point. So to look at the distance to move it back where it belongs. So conceptually, that's a poor Richter machine. Um, I can skip some of this. Classification trees or regression trees, the idea is to start with all data and we will figure out how to best split the data into two groups, okay, uh, with a choice of usually the most commonly used uh, criterion is to use Gini diversity index with or entropy information. So if it is equation, essentially if you have a split, and once you have the split and you get half and half, of course, if you look at these equations, if you have 0.5 times 0.5 square and you sum them up, you will get uh, a very high value and you want the Gini to be very low. If you get a good split, for example, you have P equal to 1 of one group and 0 to the other groups, and then you will have a, a very high Gini index, which is a good thing. Um, so you can keep on splitting until you kind of have uh, split the data into the right groups. In this case, I show you an example of how one can do diagnosis if someone have ADHD, um, oh, I'm sorry, AHD, that's a heart disease, versus no heart disease based on different clinical factors. And then once you do that, uh, let's say you train your model, you have a nice regression tree, you can create the rules that, okay, if uh, your measurement thallium less than 1.5, your CA less than 0.5, uh, OP less than 0.27, then it's very likely that you will not have these heart disease. So that's an example of the rule-based model using classification tree. Uh, the nearest neighbor, for example, the idea is if you have the training data set, you try to find, uh, once you have a new data set and you try to predict the new data set, uh, the class, based on the similarity of the neighbor around the new data set. The key is to define similarity or the distance. There's a choices, a number of choices of the distance that one can use to find, define a neighbor. Uh, neural networks are deep learning. So the idea is very similar to uh, a linear regression in a way. So the idea is you have input data, okay? And then you try to do the mapping to a hidden layers. So it's not, this equation is nothing more than a linear combination, right? Just the weighted sum to each of the hidden layer. But you put another layer on top, the output layer. You put another linear function on top of it. With this, you can actually create a nonlinear model of it. So neural networks, usually you have just one hidden layer. With deep learning, basically you have multiple layers um, and that of course with you know let's say four or five layers it's going to take more time to solve and deep learning has picked up um, has been you know quite popular in the past 10 years eight eight years is because of the computing power that we can actually compute uh, and solve these multiple layers pretty fast so deep learning has become much more um, effective um, here's some good rule of thumb uh, of when to use what algorithms. And a lot of times uh, in, in practice, uh, people just do empirical study that because nobody knows what algorithm would fit with what data. So that's pretty much data dependent. Um, so it's empirical questions. Um, and data scientists usually have quite a few um, algorithm that they choose to, um, their favorite, and they would try it out first, and they would try different algorithms. I'm going to skip some of these feature selection um, due to the time, um, but I'll go walk you through, uh, spend the last five minutes, walk you through some of the um, application of the feature selection that we work on. Um, so for example, we do uh, feature selection and build regression model for classification of production batches. We look at the wine data and we try to look at the characteristic of the grapes and the production process to predict the quality of the wine. Uh, we also use that to uh, do the feature analysis to do the prediction of uh, medical, um, the PET scan choices 
like for example, we try to see if whether, whether this person can benefit from a more advanced uh, PET scan using this respiratory gated. Uh, because not everyone will benefit from that, and we try to look at the pattern, how we breathe in and out, whether or not you will benefit from that. Um, another uh, prediction model that we use, we try to predict the image that a subject sees from MRI scan. So in other words, if you think about this, it's more like a mind reader. Basically, we look at the brain response, and we try to predict what you're actually seeing. Um, there's, a choice of, there's a choice of 10 pictures, and based on different brain response, we able to predict at about 85% accurate accuracy of, of the picture that you see based on how your brain responds. Of course, we need to use some sort of feature selection to, to build our model because so many, you know, voxels in the brain. So, but long story short, we able to, to uh, make that prediction. Um, another example of real life problem is to uh, try to predict the uh, t tibia soft tissues in the knees. So if anyone who had ever had the ACL reconstruction at your knees, for example, so um, a lot of time the doctor would have CT scan. Of course, CT scan will pick up the high density. Um, things in your knees but not soft tissues. Um, you're either going to have MRI, sometimes doctor will not do the MRI. But if you have CT scan, you try to figure out if you open up the knees where the ACL should be, for example, the knee reconstruction should be. So we do the prediction from this uh, CT scan and try to predict based on the shape of your knees uh, where your ACL should be located, for example, or other soft tissues. So that will help with uh, more of the the help the doctor to kind of estimate where it's going to be, how to drill a hole, where you should find to do the reconstruction, for example. Another example is to look at the brain um, cortical thickness to try to predict if uh, a kid has um, an ADHD attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. Um, one of the problem, one of the challenges uh, of these ADHD diagnosis is it's behavioral problems. So the doctor, the neuropsychiatrist would would diagnose this person based on the survey. Um, you know, ask the parents and ask the kids to do the survey. There's no biomarker to really diagnose this ADHD. So what our group tried to do is try to come up with biomarker using the cortical thickness like these thickness of different cortical regions and try to predict, um, create a biomarker for ADHD um, diagnosis. Um, let's skip some of this. Um, so I just want to share with you, give the credit to some of the work that I present uh, was um, funded by uh, National Science Foundation and National Institute of Health. So I hope that uh, this overview kind of give you more or less um, an idea of what data analytics is um, and, and what it can do in real life problems as well as in the research on medical problem that, that, that I show you. All right, I will end my webinar right now. So I'll let Mindy take over from here. Thank you, Dr. Art. So I know for sake of time, if you need to leave, that is just fine. Um, if you do have questions for Dr. Art right now, please type them in the type in the chat box at the bottom of the little menu on the right side of your screen, and uh, Dr. Art will be able to answer those. And while you're formulating your questions, here's just a little bit more information about the operations management degree. Uh, it's, it's 10 classes, 30 credit hours with up to four prerequisites. And it's very low cost, as you'll see here. And we also have information here about the Project Management Graduate Certificate. If anyone is interested in these, uh, please feel free to contact me. And I don't see any questions right now. But again, if you do have questions, just feel free to let us know. You can email us after the session. Here's a look at the full webinar schedule. And the video from today's session will be up on our website, hopefully within the next week. So thank you all for attending, and it looks like there may be one question here from Eric. Do you see the question, Dr. Art? 
Eric wants to know what. Yeah, I think our program has an introduction where your program, uh, uh, MSOM, has the uh, data introduction to data analytics course. Yes, that's correct. We do have an intro to data analytics, and it is taught online. And Eric, I can find out um, if it's being taught in the spring. I'm sure that it is. I think it's MTOM program is offering, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Great question. Thank you, Eric. Of course, in the course, you will get into more details of, for example, descriptive analytics, how you can get hands-on on the model. Is this similar to, I got a question from Larry Miller, is this similar to economic decision making? Um, it's similar to the last part um, of prescriptive analytics because you need to predict something you want to understand something what's likely going to happen or the probability of event a versus event b then you will make the decisions right so mm -hmm. you have you have to weigh the cause of the action a versus action b so economic decision making will help at the end I feel like this is more of a prerequisite of economic decision making because a lot of time of economic decision making, you will have um, the cost of your action, uh, the cost of your true positive, true negative, and so on and so forth. But before you get to that, you will need to, to, to have the prediction, the, the probability of what's going to happen, scenario A or scenario B. Right? Once you have that, then you could uh, do that. So Mindy, I got a question from Delhead. Will the presentation slides be posted anywhere? Yes, so the video will be posted on our website um, within about a week. It takes us a little bit to process the video and then we'll post it to the website. All right, and I got a question. Um, the question is, can we um, graduate in Operation management, pursue our career in analytics just by taking one course. Um, I would say uh, it depends because the, there's a spectrum of um, data analytics professionals. Um, you, one can range from business analytics, data analytics, and data science, like data computing. I think if you want to pursue a career in business analytics where you understand, you know, all these uh, moving parts of data analytics, but you understand business problem, and you can try to frame the problem, um, and have someone who, you know, background is in data analytics to do the modeling, uh, computation. Um, I think you could you could do that. For example, um, I work with uh, business analysts or business analytics people where they look at the data. They don't really need to have your hands on the data, but understand data enough and how to kind of frame the problem, create data frame so that um, can build the, the model. But the person doesn't really have to do it themselves. Of course, you work as a team, you have someone with, uh, you know, computing modeling degrees and who can do that for you. And then you try to translate it. Uh, once you see the outcome, you can try to understand and make sense of the business data and the outcome model that you see. Um, so what is the difference in data analytics and business analytics? Great question. Um, again, the definition, if you ask different people, um, they would provide you with different uh, definition. The way I look at it is business analytics would be someone who um, understand the data, uh, understand how the data being collected, understand Let's say, for example, each feature or each field of the data, whether or not that will be useful um, in terms of making the decision or making the prediction. Um, data analytics would be something, someone who's a little bit more hands-on, who actually can go to, let's say, the database in in, in the organization, for example, in the enterprise, can query the data. Let's say, do SQL query the data and can actually clean the data, um, put the data into data frame, and build machine learning algorithm, use machine learning algorithm, build prediction models, see the outcome. 
But at the same time, you kind of need both in the same team. So that one, let's say you make prediction and you say, okay, this is likely what's going to happen because you have these variables and then business analytics person will, will be able to help communicate with management that, oh, yes, we're going to make this decision because of, you know, these, you know, variables, you know, tells you so. Or if you have a decision rules and you say you make this decision because of this, uh, for example. So, um I would say business analytics people, in short, will be more on the business side that could help um, frame, understand the data, um, and help frame the, the data into uh, analytics questions. And data analytics will be someone who actually, you know, get the data frame, frame data, and um, um, and and can run some algorithms. Uh, I got a question: Do we need programming language experience for business analytics? Um, it's good to have, but you can get away without one. For example, um, if you know enough SQL, for example, if you know uh, about database, you can query the database, and you can um, you can use SAS, for example, uh, or you can use uh, you know GUI uh, graphic user interface. You can drag and drop, select the fields, uh, try to kind of build a simple model. I believe IBM has that. There's a lot of um, non-programming uh, tools that you can use, but I think it would be good that you understand the data. Um, data structure has a little bit of programming skills. Um, I believe in the introduction to uh, data analytic class, you will learn R, um, but it will be a basic R that is going to be non-threatening it's going to be a few lines of code to do things so that you can understand what's behind the drag and drop tools. Um, so um, I think that, that that will be good to learn, but uh, learn the basic programming, but you don't really need to do programming for living as a business analytics. What is the difference between your course and the MSOM's intro class? Uh, Mindy, can you please help? Sure. So our um, course descriptions are posted on our website, and I would direct you there to get a better idea of, you know, the difference in what our course might cover and then what the course that Dr. Art may teach would cover. Um, ours would probably be based more on, you know, the operations principles, and Dr. Art may teach more of an industrial engineering side of things. Right. So, are there any other questions? I see some people typing. Yep. Which programming language do you guide is the best, easy for any layman to start with analytic career? I would recommend um, R or Python, and there are a lot of uh, free training free tutorial out there. Uh, so, like I said, um, there's two, the focus of this class is based on the fact that you already have your data in a data frame format, right? So, once you have it in data frame format, um, you can use R or Python to do analysis. But if you want to, let's say your career, you have to deal with database and you have to kind of pull the data you might want to learn SQL a little bit, but that's very easy to learn. So I would say to start a career in, in analytics, you should learn database um, and R or Python. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for all of your questions. And for the sake of time, we'll start to wrap things up here. Um, Carol has answered that question that the MSOM course that OMGT 5653 does use R. Okay, great. So thank you everyone for attending today, and that concludes our session. All right, thank you, and 